All right, so let's do padding oracle attacks. They've been promising this slot, so let's actually do it now. So first of all, a quick reminder of the, the encryption scheme that we're going to be analyzing. This is the MAC encode encrypt construction from TLS that we talked about extensively yesterday. <coughs> Remember, we have 13 bytes of header. We have the payload coming from the application. We go through a MAC step to give us our MAC tag, which in my slides is colored orange, bright orange. And then we have the padding, which in my slides is co colored bright, bright yellow so that you can differentiate it. So here you have kind of, <coughs> kind of olive green and olive green. So it's a little bit challenging to tell them apart. But um, <laughs> the MAC tags are always going to be a slightly different shade of olive from the, from the padding in the rest of the talk. And then we encrypt this using, and here we're going to be focused on CBC mode, okay? So it's all CBC mode. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we have uh, chain initialization vectors or truly random initialization vectors doesn't make any difference. And we saw that the padding has to be one of these patterns. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, all the way up to FF, blah, 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 FF. 256 copies of FF, okay? So this is what we discussed yesterday. <coughs> any questions about that before we go on? Okay, so this is the picture you should try to keep in your head. Okay, so we're gonna focus on padding. Um, so we already said this actually, in TLS 1.0 and up, the padding always has a particular format. Uh, in SSL 3.0, uh, there was no requirement on the padding format. It was only that the last byte should tell you how much padding there is, or plus one, right? So this well, one would mean two bytes of padding. And in, S in SSL 3.0, it didn't matter what the value was here. You didn't check it. You just, look, you just looked at the last byte to tell you how many additional bytes of padding there were. So we're going to be dealing with one of these patterns, and we have to figure out a way to remove it safely. <coughs> Uh, we can have variable length padding. We already said this. We talked about this yesterday, the idea of uh, making, giving us extra protection based on the length, hiding the lengths of the, of the exchange messages. That's why you might want to use this variable length padding up to 256 bytes, okay? So that's kind of a semi-effective way of, of increasing the security. Okay, so what happens if something goes wrong with <coughs> decryption? Well, I did a check yesterday on the TLS 1.0 specification, and there are 35 mentions of the word padding, okay? And if you check them one by one, you find that only one of them tells you, uh, refers to what to do when the padding is bad, and it's in the description of this error message. So this is one of the alerts that the TLS alert protocol can send. It's a decryption failed alert, and it says that uh, you would send this message if a TLS ciphertext decrypted in an invalid way, either it wasn't an even multiple of the block length, or its padding values, when checked, weren't correct. This message is always fatal. Okay, it means you lose the keys, everything's torn out and thrown away. So this suggests that the padding format should be checked, but it doesn't really specify exactly what checks you should do. Okay, it's not explicit. It says you must check byte by byte for one of these patterns. It just says something went wrong. Okay, okay so um, Moller, Bodo Moller in 2002, pointed out that if you don't check the padding format exactly, if you don't check for one of these patterns, then there's a very simple attack that recovers the last byte of plain text from any block in the, in the stream of ciphertext blocks. So you target a block, you can then recover the last byte of, of that block, the last byte of plain text. And that's quite serious, okay, one byte, so what? But you know, that, that's an attack on TLS, right? Recovering any kind of plain text <coughs> at all is an attack on TLS. So I want to show you this attack uh, to begin with before we get to the full padding oracle attack. And we need some assumptions. We're going to assume that the attacker has managed to get encrypted a special ciphertext in which there's a complete block of padding. So what that means is that the message and the MAC together ended on a block boundary, and then TLS added a whole block of padding. So that block, if your uh, block cipher is AES with 16 byte blocks, that block would contain OF, 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 all the way up to OF, 16 copies of OF. Okay. So that means that the MAC ends on the block boundary and we have a nice, <coughs> nice block full of padding. We're also going to make the assumption that the padding is removed by only looking at the last byte and using that to decide how much padding to remove. In other words, you're not checking for this OF, OF, OF all the way. You're just looking at that last byte and stripping out that many bytes. Okay? So here's the attack. I think you can just about see that. So here's our special ciphertext blocks. I don't know if they start over here somewhere off the board. CT is the last one. You can see from the color coding almost that it's all yellow, which means it's all padding. This is the MAC value in the previous block, and it spills maybe into the block before. And here's your plain text. Okay, this is what you'd like to, you know, you want to recover some plain text from over here. So this is the special ciphertext that ends 
the Mac ends here on the block binary, and we have a complete block of padding. Okay? So we assume that we have such a thing. And now here's the attack. Uh, okay, we know that the byte value here must be OF in the very last position. And now what we do is we remove this block, CT, and we replace it by our target block, C star. This is the block whose last byte we would like to, or whose, for which the last byte of plain text down here, we would like to learn that last byte of plain text. Okay? So what's going to happen if we put the target ciphertext block here? Who can tell me what will happen during decryption? What's the first thing we do during decryption? Anybody? We decrypt, right? Then what do we do? Okay, we're going to remove, and how are we going to remove the padding? What's our assumption about how we're removing the padding? Look at the last byte. So we look at, we're going to look at the byte here, okay? Say, say the value of that byte was, I don't know, 03. Okay, what would we then do in this implementation under the assumptions that I stated? Yeah, you would remove four bytes from here, you would chop them off, and then you would interpret what comes next as the MAC value. Okay? What would happen then when you check the MAC? It would fail, right? Because the, I'm interpreting these bytes here that were actually kind of, well, they're just random bytes now, really, uh, as a MAC on, some, on the remainder of the stuff back here. And unless I'm very good at forging MACs, the MAC verification will fail. I'll get an error message. Okay? What if the value here was OF? What would happen then? Anybody? Wakey wakey. Body sleepy. OF. How many bytes would we remove if the value here was OF? 16. Okay. And our block size, I didn't say this actually, sorry. Our block size is 16. Okay? So then what happens? I treat, as, as in the implementation, I would treat this whole block as padding. I don't check it, I just remove it. Then what happens? You're good. Yeah. No. Well, now I'll interpret these bytes as MAC, and I'll verify them on this plain text and the header. Now, does MAC, MAC, does MAC verification succeed or fail now? Right, it succeeds because, actually, what I managed to do by, by pasting in a block here, removing a block and putting a different block, was that because this value turned out to be OF, I stripped off the right number of bytes so that what was left was a correct MAC and plain text and a header. So verification succeeds. So I don't get an error message and the channel stays alive. So the whole point is this, decryption succeeds if and only if that last byte is equal to OF in value. Okay? And as an attacker, I can tell when that condition has occurred, how can I tell? How do I know that decryption has succeeded or failed? Error message. You get an error message, right? TLS is very generous and it sends an error message over the channel. It actually uh, has a special type which is visible in the, in the header, in the metadata, because it's an alert message. So you actually see a special type of TLS message going past on the wire as the attacker. You know the decryption failed. So by putting this block here, if decryption succeeds, you learn something uh, or, or not, you learn something about the value of the value down here. Okay? Now that's not quite the plain text that we want, because C star here, in the original stream of ciphertext, was preceded by a different block, not CT minus one, but something else. But we can we can cope with that, so let me show you how you cope with that. Okay? So we have this equation basically, decryption succeeds if and only if <coughs> CT minus one, XOR with the block cipher decryption of C star, ends in OF. Okay? So in fact, with probability 1 over 256, you're going to recover the last byte of DK of C star. It's not quite what we want. What we really want is uh, this last byte here. We want to recover information about P star, the target plaintext, and that would equal C star minus 1 XOR DK of C star. So here C star minus 1 is, uh, is just a name I'm giving to the block that was before C star in the sequence of blocks. Okay? which I grab off the wire as the attacker, the man in the middle attacker. So I have this equation, I have that equation. If I look at these equations byte-wise and solve them, I guess I just XOR them together, and DK star of C disappears, uh, and then I can recover the last byte of P star, okay? By solving these two equations. <coughs> is, this, is the solving the equations part 
clear what you do? Okay, these are equations on blocks, and there's lots of unknowns here, but if I look at the last byte of the blocks, I can solve the two equations for the last byte. And now I recover, basically, uh, I'll recover P star in position 15. Okay, and that's it. With probability 1 over 2, 5, 6. So if I got lucky, then I've recovered some plain text. Now you might say, Kenny, come on, I could just guess the plain text by probability 1 over 2, 5, 6. Am I doing any better than guessing here? This attack only works if that condition holds on the last, on the last, on the last byte. It holds the probability one over two five six. Why is this an improvement over just guessing? Yeah, you get confirmation that it was right. You're not just saying, well, it might be F or Z. I really get confirmation. Okay, that's the difference between random guessing and actually getting confirmed guess that you were correct. Okay, now in principle, of course, I can repeat this attack. Uh, maybe it doesn't work the first time. So then I'll get another one of these special ciphertexts. I put my target block on the end again, and I can try again. Okay, except there's a problem, which is that every time there's an error message, every time there's an error in TLS, the connection is terminated and all the keys are thrown away. So you can never try the same C star. You might have to try a different C star. Okay, so every attempt, you have a probability of 1 over 2, 5, 6 of guessing, but maybe the plain text is changing each time. Still, this formally is an attack on TLS. It's a break on TLS. Okay? So if you look at TLS 1.1 and higher, what they now say is a little bit more. They say that each byte, U and 8, in the padding <coughs> data vector must be filled with the padding length value. The receiver must check this padding. Okay? So you have to look byte by byte and check that the padding has the right format. And that would stop this attack. Because now, when I put C star on the end, I might have the right value here, I might have OF here, but I'm not going to be able to fill this entire block with OFs and get the correct value everywhere so that the padding is removed successfully. Okay? So that would stop the attack. It's a patch, if you like, a, a, a bodge, to, that's a technical term, a bodge, to, um, in case you're not a native English speaker already, it's a very useful uh, term, bodge, B-O-D-G-E. To bodge something is to kind of like to hammer bits of wood onto it until it's secure. It's kind of like, like you, when your car breaks down, you bodge it so that it, it drives again, something like that. Okay, okay, so, uh, so Mahler spotted this, and TLS 1.1 and higher do something about it, they fix it. Okay, now, what I persuaded you then is that if you don't check the padding, there's an attack, and I'm going to show you an attack that works when you do check the padding. So you're screwed either way, right? That's the, the message here. Okay, so we're now going to assume that our implementation does a full padding check. It's conformant with TLS 1.1. So what we're going to do is when we do decryption, we're going to look and check that we had one of these patterns in our playtext. And we're going to get an error if none of these formats is found, and no error if, if, uh, if one of the formats is found. Okay, so we're going to do a proper padding check. And as I said yesterday, you might need to do other sanity checks as well along the way, because you might not want to remove 256 copies of FF if there isn't space in your buffer to contain 256 copies of FF. Right? You might want to do some boundary checking before you start removing stuff. Otherwise, you'll have a read beyond buffer kind of error, and C won't tell you about that. Okay? So you have to program in some other language to find out that kind of problem. So you, you might have to do more than this. Okay, so we're going to assume this. This is happening. And now in comes Vodny in 2002. And Vodny proposed this concept of a padding oracle. So this is a, a, a notional thing, it's a theoretical construct, and what we'll see is how we can build a padding oracle later. But I just first of all want to imagine that we have such a thing and talk about how we can use it. So a padding oracle receives ciphertexts, it does something you can hardly read, it decrypts to get a plain text, it checks the padding of the plain text according to some rule, so for us it would be the TLS padding rule, okay? And then it outputs a single bit of information whether the padding was valid or invalid. Okay? So it's like a kind of a theoretical version of, a, um, of an error message in some sense. It's giving you that one bit of information about whether it was valid padding or invalid. And what Vodney showed, which was kind of a surprise at the time, was that um, for CBC mode, and for certain padding schemes, including the TLS padding scheme, you can use a padding oracle to build a decryption oracle. By repeatedly <coughs> using the padding oracle in a clever way, you can actually decrypt. Okay, you can get as much plain text as you like back. And what's more, it's quite efficient. Now, 
there was already this attack by Reichenbacher in 98, who showed that in the RSA setting, in the public key setting, if you had the wrong padding scheme for RSA encryption, you could do something similar. From the error messages about whether uh, decryption had succeeded or failed, you could actually build an encryption oracle. So this is like, Vodny's work was kind of like a symmetric setting analog of, of the Reichenbacher attack. And I think, it, I think it surprised quite a lot of people that this was, this was possible. So let's see how it's done. And it's very like what we saw before with Mohr. Okay, so here is the sort of basic padding oracle attack for, for, this, for the TLS padding scheme. So here's our cipher text uh, that we're going to get decrypted under CC mode. And what we are going to do, okay, so before we begin, CT is the target block. This was what I called C star before. So we'd like to decrypt CT and find out PT, this plain text down here. Okay, and we're arranging CT so that it's the last block in a stream of a message that we're sending for the version. Okay, as the man in the middle attacker. And it doesn't have to be the last block from a message that we're targeting. It can be any block at all from the stream, as long as we know the preceding ciphertext block. Okay, so now let's look, look what happens if we do some magic here. We choose a value delta, some mask, which is a byte, and we XOR it onto the last position here. And we submit the resulting ciphertext with this modified by here to the padding oracle. If I XOR with delta here, what's the effect of that on the plaintext? What does it do to the plaintext? Well, it's split into two parts. What does it do down to this block here? If I change CT minus 1, XORing a mask of delta onto the end. Antigone, you know the answer. Yeah, you'll flip some bits here. Yeah. That will go through this encryption. Mm -hmm. So what, what can you say about this? It will change. And it will change randomly. Okay? This becomes garbage. Okay? Because we made changes, we made a delta to our block cipher input, we went through the block cipher. You can't control what's going to happen at the output. <coughs> Roughly half of the bits will flip. We don't know which bits are going to change down here. <coughs> it's randomized. Okay? So we get a garbage block here. What happens over here? I made an I XOR with delta here, and then the new ciphertext block will be XOR here onto the output of the block cipher, giving my new plaintext. What's the effect down here? Exactly. So I'll modify the last byte here by this value delta. Yeah? Does it make sense? So that's what this says. I don't think you can anybody can you read that from the back? Or is it too it's black on blue, right? It says eventually, if you try different values of delta here, you'll eventually produce a valid padding of 0, 0 down here. Eventually. Okay? You might produce O1, and it just so happens that you have an O1 by here <coughs> next to it. You have a valid padding, padding pattern of length 2, but that's much less likely than hitting 0, 0 at the end. Okay? So the most likely thing that will eventually happen, and you can systematically try the different values of delta. You start with 0, 0, and you go all the way up to FF, and one of them will work. One of them will produce the value of 0, 0, 0. Okay? So in that case, if you submit all of these different ciphertexts with the different delta values to your padding oracle, eventually the padding oracle will say valid, precisely when this value down here is 0, 0. Okay? So what do you learn in that case? Well, you now learn an equation. You learn that the original plain text value, PT, I guess it should say in the last byte, okay? XOR with this mask delta ends in 0, 0. Okay? You can solve this equation. It tells you, in fact, that the last byte of PT in that case is equal to delta. You move the, you XOR the delta on both sides and you end up with XOR delta over here. Okay? So basically, when the padding oracle says yes, you learn the last byte of the plain text. And you learn its value is equal to the happens to equal the particular value of delta that that made the padding oracle say yes. Okay, so if we have a padding oracle and we carefully cook up our ciphertexts here, we can learn one byte of plain text. We want to learn all of the plain text. So what should we do next? Can anybody who's not seen this lecture before say what should happen next? What? Shift delta, okay. What would you like to change it to? 
Uh -huh. So we're now going to target the second byte here. <coughs> Good. So what should we make this value here? We want to 0, 1. Excellent. So if we fix now a value of delta, so actually I'll just show you the picture. OK. What we now do is we set this value here to 0, 1 by choosing a value here. And we know which value to choose now because it's always the same point text. And we're assuming that the point text is fixed. OK. So we know what value to put here. And now we work with the second last position. So we fix delta 0 in this position so that we always get 0, 1 here. And now we have a delta 1 in the second last position and submit to the planning oracle until we eventually hit 0, 1, 0, 1. And when we hit 0, 1, 0, 1, we have a new equation. And it's a new equation now on the second last byte. We learn something about that. And you can write down the equation. Uh, eventually, we hit 0, 1, 0, 1. If you work out the equation, well, now we know that PT, the plain text, XOR with this mass value delta 1, delta 0, equals 0, 1, 0, 1 in the last two positions. So now we can solve the, 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 last, the second last equation here in the byte to recover the second last byte value in PT. Excellent. And we can keep on going, right? So now we set everything to 0, 2, 0, 2. And we target the third last byte, and we can keep going until we recover the whole block. So what's the cost of this attack? How many queries do I need to make to my pi model? Worst case for each byte. Let's break it down. How many queries do I need to make? Anybody's free to answer. I have all day. Yes. Uh, 16 times, times the size of the block. Right. Uh, not 16 times the size of the block. The size of the block is it's the size of the block times how many different delta values you have to try in each byte position. 16 times 256, okay? Which is 2 to the, I don't know, 12, I think. Yeah, 2 to the 12, worst case. Average case would be about half of that, okay? Because on average, you'll hit the right delta value after 128 tries on average. Okay, so this is quite efficient. And of course, what we can also do is, is we put a particular block CT here, but I emphasize that could be any block from the stream. So once we've done our target block, we'll go after another block. And we'll build up full plain text information if we want. OK? OK, good. I think we've said all of that. OK, so the question, OK, so that was kind of theoretically how you could use this padding oracle to build an attack. What happens in practice? Can we get a padding oracle in practice for TLS implementations? So in TLS, you get an error message during decryption either from a failure of the padding check or, if the padding is good, the MAC check is likely to fail. Okay? Because in this attack here, if you imagine this is now a TLS ciphertext, by doing these bit flips here and randomizing this block, we're certainly going to make an invalid MAC in this, in this plain text. So it will break and we get a MAC error. Okay? So, um, Body's padding oracle attack will produce an error of one type or the other. And so a padding failure would tell you that you have incorrect padding. And a MAC failure would tell you that you had correct padding. Because you only get the MAC failure message if the padding was good. So now you have your padding oracle, right? Because of the different error messages. For the theoreticians in the room, until quite recently, nobody considered the possibility that a symmetric encryption scheme might have more than one error message. And what the effect that would be on security. Okay. So, interesting theoretical consideration here that, that you can have schemes that are secure if there's only one error message, which break if you have two or more error messages. Which is kind of interesting. Okay, if you could tell these error messages apart, if you could distinguish them, or these error conditions, then you should be able to do a padding model attack, right? So can we? Well, there's good news for the attacker. In TLS 1.0, these error messages are different. One, is, one gives you a bad record MAC error message, and the other gives you a decryption failed error message. So you have these distinct error messages. The bad news for the attacker is these error messages are actually encrypted. So you can't, if you're the attacker and you don't know the keys, you can't easily see them. There's another really big negative here, though, which is that either of these error conditions is, is fatal. This is TLS, remember. So any time one of these error events occurs, the TLS session is destroyed and the keys are thrown away. So the attacker gets one go at doing this. And how many trials did he need? He needed two to the 12 trials to decrypt the block. But he, he only gets one trial, and it's game over, because the errors are all fatal. 
Okay? So it looks like you can't really make this work. But uh, undeterred, a year later, Rodney came back with Canval, Canval sorry, Hilkin and Vigneault. Uh, and this is a really beautiful paper, which I strongly encourage you to read from. It's a classic, I think, from 2003. And what they observed was the following. That if there's a Mac failure, it will occur later than if there's a padding failure. And so the error message will appear on the network later than a padding error message would occur. So instead of looking for the error message, which you can't see because it's encrypted, you try to time the error message. You time its arrival on the network at the man in the middle. And the idea is that the, the, the reason this, this happens is because an implementation would only bother to do the Mac check if the padding was good. If the padding is bad, you, you immediately stop and send your error message. You're done. Okay? But Mac checking takes time. So if the padding is good and you do the Mac check, it will take some time to do the Mac computation. And don't, only then will the error message be sent. So there's a timing difference. Okay? And what they also realized was that, very nicely, is that you could amplify the timing difference by making the message as long as possible. The longer the message is, the more time it takes to check the Mac. And the maximum message size in TLS is about 2 to the 14 bytes. So they made their, they made their messages as close to that as they could. And they were able to make the timing difference on kind of a realistic uh, experimental setting about 2 milliseconds. That's a huge timing difference over a network. It's very easy to see a 2 millisecond timing difference, particularly on a LAN. Even if you're a couple of hops away, actually, uh, you know, through a couple of routers, you can still see a timing difference of 2 milliseconds. Okay, but we're still stuck, right? Because these errors are fatal. You only get one go, so all you can really do is learn one byte of plain text, and then with probability one over two five six. So this is not really better than uh, we could do already with the Mauler attack. We haven't really got much further. Although it does show that a full padding check also has a vulnerability. But this is where they got really clever. They then said, well, hang on. There will be situations where the plain text is fixed across many different TLS sessions. It's fixed and in a fixed position. For example, a password every time you log into a website. Or a modern viewpoint, an HTTP session cookie, like we saw yesterday in the, in the uh, beast and crime attacks. So what they said was, well, we'll do a multi-session attack. Every time we do a trial, the, we, we learn something, maybe, by typing the error message. We lose the keys, but then we wait until the same password say, is encrypted and sent again and then we do our next trial. The key will be different every time, okay? But uh, the key point about the multi-session version is that even though the ciphertext blocks are changing all the time, and the key is different <coughs> every time we do a trial, to the, every time we, we, we time an error message, the plain text is going to be fixed. So the attack works. Even though these ciphertext blocks are changing, I just have to make sure that I use the right deltas here. I'll start with 0, 0 and build all the way up to FF. And each, each session I have, I'll try a different value of delta. And maybe I'll try each value of delta several times because it's a bit noisy. And I'd like to get rid of the noise by having multiple timings. Okay? So even though the key is changing and the ciphertext blocks are changing, the fact that the plain text is fixed means that we can try our deltas here in sequence. And we're then you know, making the offsets happen here. Uh, you know, whatever this byte is, x or 0, 0, x or 0, 1, and so on, all the way up to Eventually, one of them will give us the right error message. Okay. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that you can still do the attack, even though the ciphertexts are changing for every session, and even though the key is changing. This, kind of, this attack is kind of key independent. It doesn't care about the key. It just cares about the structure of this XOR here. That's really, really why it's working. And the fact that the plain text is fixed. Okay. Does it make sense? Kind of? It's kind of a subtle point that I think is quite hard to absorb, of course. So this is, this is an important Thing. Okay, just to going back a slide. So um, the modern viewpoint of this is not to look for passwords being retransmitted like, like they did. They looked at Outlook passwords. Okay, they looked at the uh, Outlook was running over SSL, and they discovered that Outlook would send a password for every directory that was downloaded or every message that was sent. So there were a lot of sessions that they could target. It took them about three hours with a couple of thousand sessions to recover the password, but they could do it. They also used some quite clever stuff to do with uh, password guessing strategies. Not trying every value of delta, but making clever choices of delta to, to try particular password characters one after another. Um, 
the modern viewpoint of all of this is to say, well, forget about uh, passwords. Let's go after session cookies. And let's use this malware, this JavaScript running in the browser, as a way of generating all the sessions that we need. So you have the, the, the JavaScript will send these get requests over HTTP. Each get request will have the cookies attached. Each time the attacker sees the, the encrypted HTTP message, the man in the middle attacker, he does the bit flipping, chooses the next delta, sends the message on, the connection will be lost, but the next time JavaScript sends the next get request for the browser, a new TLS session will be established automatically. So the, the attacker doesn't even have to do anything, he just has to, well, he has to do something, but he doesn't have to do anything with SSL. All the SSL stuff is taken care of for him by the browser. Okay? So the modern viewpoint of this kind of attack is that, well, no, hang on, let's use JavaScript running in the browser to get the, the, the chosen plain text capability. Okay, so great. That is the planning oracle attack of Vodney. What are the countermeasures? Well, the ideal thing would be to say, hang on, there's something fishy here. We shouldn't really be using uh, encrypt then, in, sorry, Mac then encode then encrypt. Why don't we do something else? Why don't we do the padding first and then Mac and then encrypt? Or maybe, uh, so move the padding inside the Mac, which would be interesting, might work. Or even better, put the Mac on the outside use an encrypt then Mac construction. Because we know that this is, you know, this, there are nice security proofs for encrypt then Mac. Okay, this would be a good thing to do. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. What the TLS developers did, or the TLS uh, working group did, was they took the path of least resistance and they put a patch in. We'll talk about the patch in a minute. You could switch to using RC4. Um, or, and this is what they did, you add a fix to make sure that you can't tell a difference between bad padding and bad Mac. So, you would try to ensure uniform errors, uniform timing, uniform error messages. So what you would do is check the Mac anyway, even if the padding is bad. And now you would always check the Mac, so you would assume that the timing difference would go away. If the padding is good, you check the Mac. If the padding is bad, you check the Mac. There's no timing difference anymore. Nothing to tell. Nothing to see. The idea is that then you give you security, you can't tell the difference. And this is what's in the TLS 1.1 and 1.2 specifications, and it's pretty much how things stood for more or less 10 years after Vodney's attack in 2002 and then the follow-up paper in 2003. So really, padding oracles were regarded as a solved problem for SSL TLS, right? By doing, always doing the Mac check. There's still in the background was this kind of steady trickle of other papers showing that padding oracle attacks could be done against other systems other than SSL TLS. So there's a lot of P's in here, and you can guess who P is. I did a lot of this stuff. This is particularly nice. This is Duong and Rizzo, the guys who came up with, uh, with Crime and Beast. And this was kind of their warm-up act for, for Beast and Crime in 2010, the POET attack on ASP.NET. So ASP.NET is kind of an application pro programming framework for building web applications on Microsoft systems. ASP.NET used some crazy padding and no integrity protection, so we could do a padding oracle attack. And this is how they sharpened up their tools to do the beast and the crime. Okay. So this should have been a warning that bad things were coming a year later and two years later, I guess. There's a very nice paper by uh, um, Jaeger and Som Somorovsky from 2011 where they showed that you could, break, you could break XML encryption using padding oracle ideas. Okay. And then there's this paper in 2012 by uh, Nadim Alfardan and myself, where we looked at the OpenSSL implementation of DTLS, not TLS, but DTLS, 10 years almost after, after Vodney's work. And actually, this is where we sharpened our tools for the Lucky 13 attack. So this is our little kind of, little kind of safe playground to try <coughs> to years before moving on to the more serious business of trying to break uh, TLS instead of DTLS. So let's look at this attack briefly. Um, so our question was, can we apply this padding oracle attack idea to DTLS? But you would think, come on, everybody knows about padding oracle attacks, everything's going to be patched, you have no chance. Well, what we found is that even though DTLS 1.0 is based on the TLS 1.0 spec, so it should have these countermeasures in place, we shouldn't expect a different <coughs> side channel to exist. Uh, we actually found out that the OpenSSL implementation of DTLS in these versions here did not check the Mac if the padding check fails. So they had not implemented the counter -measure. And so the timing difference that, we, that is in this paper here from 2003 should still be present. 
And the really cute thing is that DTIS doesn't treat failures during decryption as being fatal. Okay? Because it's running over UDP and UDP is unreliable, it can't be as harsh as to say, oh, if something went wrong, it must be under attack. Maybe it's just noise in the communications channel or a dropped packet. So you might be able to do the attack in a single session, which would be really nice. You don't have to wait for the handshake to run and for a new, the same plain text to be sent again. You can repeatedly attack everything in a single session. And then you don't need the repeated plain text assumption anymore either. You just extract any plain text you want. But there's a problem. In DTOS, there are no error messages. So whenever something goes wrong during decryption, there isn't an error message sent back that you can type. There's nothing to type. Okay? So it's, you know, the, the good Lord gives with one hand and he takes away with the other hand. <laughs> Not that I believe in that kind of stuff. Anyway, in fact, we've got around this problem. So here's our attack packet. This is like a Vodney-style attack packet. And here's something you might recognize. This is a heartbeat packet. Okay? And this is in 2012 or 2011. This is before heartbeat, right? So we were, we were the first people to use heartbeat to do something bad, right? I wish we'd looked at the source code. We might, we might have found Markleet and saved the world a lot of pain. Okay, so what we do now is we send, we send our attack packet, and immediately afterwards we send this thing called a heartbeat packet. And this is like an ICMP ping. Okay, so what happens is the attack is received over here by the server. The attack packet goes wrong, but it takes some time to process. And then the server sends back a heartbeat response. Okay, so you can think of this as being a bit like the error message. Okay? And the time it takes for the heartbeat response to arrive tells you how long it took to process the attack packet and the heartbeat packet together. Okay? So we, there were no error messages, but we kind of made something that's like an error message. At the time when we started this work, heartbeat was only optional in, in, uh, in DTLS. It was an optional extension, but as soon as OpenSSL implemented it, we were able to do our attack. And they conveniently had it implemented for us. It was there for us to exploit. Okay, so there's the idea of the attack then. So this attack packet will take longer to process if the padding is good, because it will then check the Mac, than if the padding is bad. So now we measure the timing difference between sending this structure, pair of packets, one after another, and this packet coming back. So it's like a proxy for timing these error messages. <coughs> but actually, we can do even better. These error messages are not fatal. So why don't we put a bunch of attack packets together, one after another? And they're all going to fail in the same way. They either all either have good padding or bad padding. Okay? So now, so this is, you can't really see it unfortunately, but this is actually one, two, three. This is three messages one after another. It's an identical attack packet. One, two, three. Okay? In attacks, you might put 10 or 20 there. And what you're now doing is each of these takes a certain amount of time to process. So the timing differences are now cumulative. So you get this amplification. Okay? And this is good because there's a maximum size that this packet can be, which is governed by the size, the size that UDP can handle, which is like you know, maybe 1,500 bytes. So we could play this trick uh, that, that Vodny and Al could play of using very long packets. You can get around it by doing this concatenation trick. Okay? So that's it. So this all works. And uh, here's some results. I don't know. I don't really want to go into the details. But this is the timing difference for blue is for, uh, I get this right, Blue is bad padding, which is kind of fast because we don't check the Mac, and red is good padding and bad Mac. It takes longer to process. <coughs> it takes longer for the error message to come back. You see there's kind of this kind of weird humpy behavior. We don't really know why this is there. You have to do some statistical analysis. You have to remove outliers and smooth things and look at multiple trials. But you can make it work. So for example, if we had 192 byte packets, two packets per train, okay, that's quite small. Uh, we try 10 different trains for each byte value, so we're doing multiple tests to try and make up, make up for the noise, do some basic statistical processing. You can get a 0.996 uh, success probability. So it only goes wrong four times out of a thousand and recover, the, recover a single byte, or if you want to recover a whole block, you can get a 94% success probability. And what you try to do, of course, is you try to minimize the product of all of these numbers because that's the total amount of ciphertext that you have to send. And you want to try and make as little use of the network as you can and get as much bang for your buck as possible. So you can make it all work. And this was an acute paper that we published in NDSS in 2012. Okay, so why did the OpenSSL developers not bother to check the Mac even if the padding was bad? Why didn't they implement the countermeasure? 
we speculate it's because there are no error messages, so they thought there would be nothing to time. But then somebody came along and, and, and invented the heartbeat, heartbeat uh, kind of ping, and we were able to use that as a means of getting these error messages. And the fact is that DTLS turned out to be a lot easier to break than TLS because we were able to amplify the timing differences and we were able to do everything in a single session because none of these error messages are fatal. And this has got something to do with the fact that we're running over UDP instead of TCP. If you're a theoretician again, think about this. Our normal security models for encryption don't make any assumptions and are completely independent of what kind of uh, transport we have, what kind of network we're using. But here, it makes a difference in terms of attacks. Okay, so this is potentially something to think about, something to look at. Okay, finally then, in the last sort of 20 minutes, we'll talk about Lucky 13. So, Remember I said that the response to the padding oracle attack was to say, well, always check the Mac. Okay? And here's exactly what the specifications say you should do. Okay? They say implementations must ensure that the record processing time is essentially the same whether or not the padding is correct. In general, the best way to do this is to compute the Mac even if the padding is incorrect and only then reject the padding. So this is the kind of value we've been talking about. Okay, now the timing is going to be the same. The question is, what should you compute the Mac on? Right? You've got this structure here, payload, Mac tag, and padding. <coughs> and what you've just found out is that the padding is invalid. It's not one of these valid patterns. So what you don't know is how do you you've got a buffer here with bytes in it, how do you parse this buffer into valid padding or into something? Mac tag and payload so that you can then remove the padding. Okay, it's not clear what you should do because you're not checking something that has the right structure. Do you see the problem? Does it make sense as a problem? It's kind of a software engineering problem, right? I've got this thing, um, it doesn't look right, what should I do? I've been told to check the Mac. The Mac is checked on the payload, but I don't know where the payload begins. I know where it begins, but I don't know where it ends because I don't know how much padding there is because it's not properly formatted. You're kind of screwed, right? So, actually, there's advice in the spec. What it says is the following. For instance, if the pad appears to be incorrect, the implementation might assume a zero length pad and then compute the Mac. Okay? So what that means is you say, well, if the padding isn't correctly formatted, you know, it ends uh, 02, 03 or something. So what we'll pretend is there's no padding at all. We'll put a little line here and we'll assume that the next so many bytes are the Mac tag and everything else is the payload and the header. Okay. I mean, it's reasonable. You have to check the Mac on something. I don't know. Check it on as much as you can. That's kind of the, the attitude. Okay. This is intriguing. In fact, this is pretty much what everybody did. Uh, if you look at all these implementations, it's what they do. So OpenSSL is used kind of everywhere. NSS is used in Chrome and Firefox. Bouncy Castle is a big Java library. Another one, OpenJDK, is also a Java, a Java library. You can do other things. So if you're, if you're uh, Nikos running GNU TLS, you'll always do something different from everybody else, and he has a different way of doing it, and we also broke that, so, okay, <laughs> it's fine. Um, and then it specs out something really intriguing, which I have to tell you, we didn't know about until we'd actually completed our research. The spec says, this is not, okay, it, it, this leaves a small timing channel, since Mac performance depends to some extent on the size of the data fragment, but it is not believed to be large enough to be exploited. <coughs> due to the large block size of the existing Macs and the small size of the timing signal. At the time, if you just read that, it's kind of, it's not really clear what it's saying. It's saying, well, maybe there's a problem, maybe there's not, we're not really sure, we think it's good enough. Um, we didn't know about this uh, when, we, when we came up with Lucky But there's a clue in the spec that something is not quite right, even now, with this, with this fix. So let's talk about Lucky 13. This was, again, Nada and myself uh, came up with this. And, okay, let's skip the advertising. Uh, there's a website here if you want to read more, Lucky 13. There's also a clothing brand in North America called Lucky 13. Um, they never sent me any free t-shirts or anything, so I'm still, still waiting. Okay, so here's the main idea of the attack, okay? So the decryption is going to remove <coughs> the padding and the Mac tag to, kind of, to, get, to get at the payload. And the HMAC calculation is going to be done on this data structure, sequence, header, payload. Remember, this was 13 bytes, 8 plus 5, and then our payload. When you do the HMAC computation, before you do anything, HMAC 
is calling a hash function, and the hash function will add nine bytes of padding of its own. Okay, it'll be a length field plus some padding, or at least nine bytes, sorry, possibly more bytes, to take it up to some kind of block boundary for the compression function of the hash algorithm to be applied. So there's internal padding going on inside the hash function inside the HMAC. So there's all these layers you have to dig through, right? It's a bit like, um, well, yeah, you have to go down, down the rabbit hole to find all these different things. So what this means, though, the key thing is that the running time of the HMAC computation depends on the exact length of this data structure, the sequence number, the header, and the payload. In particular, if this length is less than or equal to 55 bytes, if you do the calculation, you will use four compression function calls to the compression function of your hash function, say shell one. If the byte length is between 56 and 119, it'll need five, okay? If it's between 120 and 183, you'll need six compression function calls. The compression function is this kind of internal part of the hash function that does all the squishing and the manipulation and gives you the, you know, gives you the goodness, right? It takes, I don't know how many bytes it is, 512 bytes, and squeezes it down to some number of bytes. I can't remember the exact numbers right now. So the amount, the number of compression function calls you need is kind of increasing in jumps, depending on the number of bytes that you're processing. Okay, so here's the attack now. I'm first of all, I'm going to show you a distinguishing attack so you get the idea, and then show you plain text recovery. So we'll start with a warm-up of distinguishing. So here's the distinguishing attack. The attacker asks for encryption of one of two messages. Here's his messages. So we assume the handshake is run, right? And there's a key here in the client, key in the server. Here's our man in the middle, or devil in the middle. He's going to intercept the ciphertext. He's going to change it somehow and send it on. So C is the encryption of message M, and this is the MAC encode encrypt construction. And M is one of these two possibilities. It's either 287 random bytes, we don't care. They can be the same byte, they can be uh, just totally random, followed by a single byte zero zero. Or 32 random bytes followed by 256 copies of FF. Okay? These two messages are the same length. They're both 288 bytes long. Right? So I'm not cheating here by choosing messages that have different lengths. Okay? So, okay, here's the attack then. So here's, here's the plain text in case one and the plain text in case two. It's in green, R followed by lots of more R's, followed by zero, zero. And here we've got, so this, let me just check the number again. So this, this here is 32 random bytes followed by 256 random bytes, sorry, 255 followed by zero, zero. And this is 32 random bytes followed by 256 copies of FF. Okay, so one of these two messages is going to get encrypted. So let's see what happens when they get encrypted. Well, they both, they're both designed to end on a block boundary. So that what happens is you add uh, a MAC tag in a new block and some padding in both cases, the same amount in both cases. Okay, so this will actually be, if this was 20 bytes for HMAC SHA1, then this would be 12 bytes of padding, 20 plus 12 to take you up to the next block boundary. Okay, so this is what's actually going to be encrypted under CDC mode. So that gives us our two ciphertexts with some IB. And now what the attacker does is he molds the ciphertext. In either case, he doesn't know which case he's in, he's going to remove the last two blocks. Okay, he's just going to delete them before he, to make his C prime, before he sends this on the network to the server to be decrypted. So what have I done here, effectively, by deleting the last two blocks? Did anybody see? Yeah, I've removed the padding and I've removed the mag field. Okay? So what's left, what will get decrypted, is the payload, which was constructed to be either this or this. Okay? So what does the decryption do? Sorry, after we've done the decryption, which is what this picture shows, what happens next? What happens in the first picture? What do we always do after decryption? We remove the panning. Is the panning good here? How many bytes of panning are there? One. What about the second case? How many bytes? Is the panning good? And how long is the padding? Two five, two, five, six, right? So in the first case, I have one byte of valid padding, a 20 byte MAC for the next 20 bytes, and then a 267 byte message. In the other case, I have a 256 byte padding, a 20 byte MAC field, and 12 bytes of message. 
So they get interpreted by TLS encryption in this way. A little bit of padding, a Mac, and a lot of message. A lot of padding, a Mac, and a short message. In either case, the padding is removed, okay, and then the Mac is checked. How long does the Mac check take? Well, what did I tell you about how long Mac checking takes? It depends on the length of the message you're checking, right? If you do the calculation, you have to remember the 13 bytes of header and sequence number, okay? Here, we're checking on 280 bytes, and here, we're only checking on 25 bytes, if you work out the arithmetic, okay? And I've chosen these numbers carefully so that there's no underflow, so that any sanity checking will pass, etc., etc. So these are, these are carefully constructed. So this has slow Mac verification, and this has fast Mac verification. And if you work out the difference, the timing difference is the time it takes to do four SHA-1 compression function evaluations. Okay? How long is that? Well, it depends on your processor, depends on your clock speed, okay? But it's something like 3,000 or 4,000 clock cycles, okay? So here's an example in our experimental setup of the distinguishing attack. The thing on the right is the top line of the long message, and the thing on the left is the, is the, is the short message. And the peak-to-peak -peak timing difference here is very noisy, you can see, but <coughs> you can clearly separate the peaks. And the timing difference was about 3.2 microseconds. Remember in the Vodney, original Vodney padding article attack, or follow-up paper, the timing difference was 2 milliseconds. And that's because effectively, they were able to make this thing very, very long, so that the Mac check took a long time to do. Okay, here, we care about the difference in the time it takes to do the Mac checks. And it's four Mac compression function evaluations. We've actually made it as big as we can, given the restrictions on padding and TLS. You couldn't make it bigger than this. Four is the maximum you can do. You want to make it as big as possible because that makes the attack work better. Okay, so this is real experimental data that Nadia uh, slaved away in the lab to generate, and you can see there's a clear thing. Okay, so if you work out your success probability, if you do a standard statistical test here to try to separate these peaks, if you have 64 sessions, 64 calls to this left or right encryption oracle, your success probability of distinguishing whether it's left or right, zero or one, is about 99%. So you can do this effective attack. Even with one session, your success rate is 75%. Your guessing strategy would be 50%. So you're doing 25% more than just random guessing, already with one encryption. Okay? That's a distinguishing attack based on this kind of compression function timing business. Okay? However, that's not enough, right? You've got to show the implementer or the TLS guru You've got to show him his plain text. You've got to show him his own password in a live demonstration. That's really what you need to do to convince people to change. So obviously, what we'd like to do next is build a plain text recovery attack based on these elements. Okay? So as an exercise, I'd now like you to do that. No, I'm joking. It's not so easy. But it's not really difficult now either. You've got all the key ideas you need. You're going to try to create some messages um, in such a way as to create a timing difference depending on something to do with the padding or something to do with plain text that's interpreted as padding. And that will leak something about the plain text. Okay? This is like, it's like Vodney's padding oracle attack on steroids, basically. This is kind of what you're doing. So let's look at it. Okay, I'll show you how it works. Um, this is one of my favorite things in the world. Okay, I'm slightly biased. So let's, let's see if we can read this. Okay, so here we're going to make a magic ciphertext. Okay? We're going to have an IV, so let's assume we have explicit random IVs. It also works for chain IVs. We have two random blocks, garbage blocks, we don't care what's in them. We have CT minus one and we have CT. And this is our target block, CT. And this is the block that comes before it in the stream, again. Okay? So this is our target plaintext that we'd like to get. And what we're going to do is we're going to do kind of what you've seen before. We're going to play with two byte masks in the last two positions here. So two byte value is delta. Okay? So I'm going to XOR delta on here. So what will happen down here? What will happen? What are the possible things down here? Well, okay. I don't know if you can really read that. You could either have 0, 1, 0, 1, a valid pattern. You could have, uh, or maybe even a longer valid pattern, right? So it would end maybe 0, 2, 0, 2, 0, 2 or something, but that's not very likely. So let's say 0, 1, 0, 1. Or you could have something 0, 0, also valid, 
or you could have bad padding. Okay, those are really the three possibilities for what can happen when you choose a particular value of delta. Yeah? Who's, who's still with me at this point? Okay, a few hands, not so many. Okay. That's good. I'm happy if I can get like five of you to the end. <laughs> That's a victory. So we're going to look at the special case now of H max sha one and AES CBC. So our blocks are going to be 16 bytes long, and the size of the MAC value is going to be 20 bytes, okay? because SHA-1 has a 20 byte output. So let's look at each of these three cases in turn. Let's do a case analysis. So let's suppose we chose a value of delta such that this ends 0101. Okay? That means when we decrypt this, we remove two bytes of padding, we remove 20 bytes for the MAC, and now what's left? Well, if you do the count, <coughs> 2 plus 20 is 22, which means over here there must be 10 bytes in this green box here. There's 16 here, 16 here, and how many were there here? 13. If you do the arithmetic, that's 55. So we're going to do MAC verification on a message which is exactly 55 bytes long. How many compression function evaluations do we need for that? Any advice on two? Two. No, it's not two. Who says four? Somebody. Yes, correct. That's what I told you. Right. So the thing about HMAC, why it's not two, is that HMAC does this kind of outer compression, outer hashing, sorry, inner hashing, and then outer hashing. It kind of it processes with a key, and then it brings in another key and reprocesses. So the minimum number is actually four, that you can, the number of compression function evaluations you do when you do HMAC. It's not what you think it is, it's not two, it's four. So this is four, okay, to check H mac here. Let's look at the next case. I think you can probably guess what's going to happen. If the padding ended 01 here, sorry, uh, 00, that's also valid. We remove one byte and another 20 bytes for the Mac, and now we're left with 56 bytes. How many compression function evaluations do we need? Five. So this is exactly on this transition between four and five. That's why I chose all of these numbers to be what they are, to make that transition happen. Okay, to go from four to five. Okay, what about the third case? Who can predict without me showing you what happens in the third case? The third case, remember, was bad padding. How does the spec say we should treat bad padding? What do we do? <coughs> Sorry? The biggest net will be that. Okay, right. So in fact, okay, so in the last case, so that's also five, okay? And in the last case, if the padding is bad, we pretend there's no padding at all during decryption. That's what the TLS spec tells us to do. So then we have 20 bytes of MAC, and now we're checking on 57 bytes. So we went 55, 56, 57, and this is also four, uh, sorry, this is also five <coughs> shallow and compression function validations. So the key thing is that if your plain text ended for a particular choice of delta up here, if it ended 0101 down there, it's going to be 4. If it ends with anything else, it's 5. So now we have a timing difference. Okay? We've reconstituted or reanimated the timing difference uh, here. Okay? So whatever happens, we get an error message because either the padding is bad or the MAC is bad. The MAC is always going to be checked. The attacker times this. Okay? And now there's a timing difference between the 0101 case and the other two cases. So if we see a fast error message, we know that it ended 0101. And if we don't see it very quickly, we guess that we, we didn't hit 0101 yet. So we keep trying different values of delta until we hit fast error message. And then we know. The timing difference, though, is quite small. Instead of being, instead of being 4,000 clock cycles, it's now about 1,000 clock cycles. It's now maybe a microsecond or less. Okay? So this is now 2,000 times smaller than the timing difference that Canval et al. were measuring <coughs> when they broke OpenSSL in 2003. That's Moore's law of networking, right? The network got 2,000 times faster. That's not what happened. The timing difference got that much smaller, and processors got faster. So it's harder to measure, but you can measure it. Particularly if you're on the same LAN, you have a good chance of measuring this timing difference. Okay? So, all right, so if we hit 0101, we have an equation like this. We know that the target block XOR with the particular mask value gives us 0101. We solve the two byte equations and we now recover PT in the last two bytes, our target plain text block. And of course, we can keep going. We can extend just like in the standard padding oracle attack 
And now, once we've hit this, we can extend one byte at a time and recover the whole, the whole thing. But it's multi-session, because every time I do this, I have a bad back and I lose the TLS condition. So I need this repeated plain text assumption once again to make this work. Okay? So what would the cost of this time be? Christine. If you go to the zero point, then uh, yeah. uh, your rules are dependent on whether the first two bytes were correct. Absolutely. And you said you have to go to Absolutely. Well, if you can repeat enough, then you can go to the Right, absolutely. So if you're sort of, for everybody, in case you didn't hear it, the point was that if you don't successfully recover the first two bytes, if you have a false positive, then the attack will go wrong for all subsequent bytes. And you won't, you won't be able to tell that it's gone wrong, right? It will be totally messed up. Except that actually then you'll be in the territory of everything being a bad path, and you'll never get the timing signal. So the fact you never get it tells you that you're not there. But what's important is when you're evaluating the success of this attack, you have to look at the total cost of recovering a whole block. And what you might want to do is put a lot of effort into recovering those first two bytes to make sure you've got them right before you start extending your path. So you're absolutely right to highlight that as, a, as an issue, and it's something you need to think about if you want to turn this into a, a practical attack. So what I was asking just before, just to put your hand up, was, was what's the cost of this attack? How many sessions do we need before we hit this 0101 pattern? This is an easy question, I hope. Anybody? Okay, let me ask an even easier question. At this point in time, who's still with me? Who's still following? Okay, a few of you, good, good. So, how many different deltas do we have to try, on average, to hit 0101 in the pattern? How many bytes are we trying to recover at once? Six, five, five, six, six, six. Right, you're allowed to say 2 to the 16. <laughs> 2 to the 16, 65, 536, yeah? Divided by 2, because on average we'll get there half or half the time, but actually the timing difference is so small that we do actually try all the different delta values and we have to try each delta value more than once. In our experimental setup, we have to try each delta value <coughs> about two to the eight times. <coughs> okay? So the headline cost of this attack, okay, well, I say here two to the seven instead of two to the eight, to get reliable distinguishing of this small timing difference. Okay? The headline cost is two to the 23 sessions, because each trial kills a session. And that gets you back two bytes of play text. The cost after that is quite cheap for the rest of that block. Okay? This is hardly going to make headline news, right? This is not going to get the New York Times in a froth about whether TLS is broken or not. But what did I teach you yesterday about attacks over time? What happens? They get better, right? So let's make the attack better. Let's make an assumption. Let's suppose that one out of the last two plain text bytes is already known then we know how to set the delta value for the corresponding byte to make sure we always hit 01 in that byte. So now the cost of the attack drops from 2 to the 16 to 2 to the 8. If the plain text is base 64 encoded, which cookies are typically, then instead of needing 2 to the 8 attempts per byte, you only need 2 to the 16. And now you still need to do multiple trials for each byte. Uh, 2 to the 7 is still sufficient. So now instead of the 2 to the 23 trials, we've actually more or less square rooted the attack. Now we're down to 2 to the 13 trials. Okay? And now, how do you realize this 1 out of 2 condition? Would well, you remember that thing I showed you yesterday by sliding things around in the beast attack? We do the same. So now we use all of those beast ideas that were also used in crime in Lucky 13. So what we do is we have JavaScript running in the client because the poor user visited a bad website. The JavaScript makes the get requests the browser will generate all the TLS sessions for us. We pad the get requests so that there's only ever one byte at the end of the block that we don't know at the time. Everything else in the block we know. Okay? Or at least we know the one out of the last two blocks. Be uh, bytes. Because it'll be something like a stereotypical point text byte, like cookie, the E of cookie, or the equal sign that comes after cookie. Okay? So the cost of the attack has gone from two to the 23 sessions, which I don't know how to generate, down to the 13 get requests per byte of cookie. And that's now practical. Okay, we've gone from theoretical to practical in one slide. And I should credit Eric Ruscorla with pointing this out to us. So Eric Ruscorla is the guy, one of the guys who's behind the TLS uh, work in ITF. We disclosed the attack to him 
And he said, you know, you could combine it with these ideas. So this is really thanks to Eric that it became more serious. I have okay. a question. Yes, I'm glad. Quick question. Uh, yes. Did you run this attack using the JavaScript code? Yes. Against which browser? Uh, it was in Chrome, I think. Oh, really? Because the way I understood it, maybe I'm wrong, yeah. if you correct me. You have to load the JavaScript code sure. through your malicious server, that mm -hmm. acts as an infection vector. Absolutely. And then you need to send the, the TLS packets to the server you want to yep. attack, right? Yeah. But it, You're going to tell me about the same origin policy. Yeah, I want to understand how you go, how you bypass the same origin policy. The same origin policy doesn't apply because of the way that um, the JavaScript is allowed to talk to other web pages to fetch content, like an ad, for example. Yeah, yeah. So the same origin policy doesn't apply to, well, it does apply to that JavaScript, but maybe not in the way that you think it does. So there's no requirement here for an SOP bypass. There's no zero-day vulnerability. Oh, OK. So, yeah. <coughs> so we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. Okay. It's a completely standard thing. And we'll see it also in the RC4 attack, which we really did implement using JavaScript. There's, there was no need. To, we actually built the lab with the two servers, the malicious server and the, and the attack server, and it works perfectly. It, it worked. It works. Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no nastiness. Yeah. I was wondering if you were. Right. There, there was nastiness for some reason in the beast attack, and that's because they had to um, make the the block that they were attacking at the very start of the HTTP request, and that's harder to do. But we didn't, we didn't need that. So okay. they, they did require an SOP. Okay. <coughs> Thank goodness. Otherwise, we wouldn't have got anywhere. Okay, so I'm kind of out of time, right? So let me let me wrap up with just showing you a picture. This is slightly artificial, but this is the, the, the one out of two attack. So we, we made sure that byte 14 of the plain text was set to 01, and byte 15 was set to FF. Okay, and we sent lots of plain text with that structure. We tried different delta values, modifying them in position 15. And what you see is that when delta 15 is equal to FE, when you XOR FE with FF, you get O1. So then you would have valid padding, and you see the timing difference. It's faster. Okay? So this, is, this timing difference between this point <coughs> and all of those points is one compression function evaluation. If you look at the number of cycles on, this, on the left-hand side, uh, I can't say right now how many. I think it's about 2,000 cycles. This was on a pretty slow machine. Okay? And that's the timing difference that you're looking for. This is a lie, though, this, this picture, because these are median times. In fact, each of these points is really a distribution spread up and down the, the, the vertical axis. And all these things are kind of overlapping with each other. So you have to extract by doing enough trials, maybe using medians, for example, or other statistics, you can extract the, the one that's got the, the smallest running time, the, the fastest error speed. Okay? So in reality, this is it's more complicated than this, but that gives you the, the kind of picture <coughs> out of the lab. 